Good afternoon, everyone. Are you having a good time? Good. Are we mixing it up? We're networking. We're getting here. We're listening to personal testimonials from people like Malik Yoba. We're learning about new concepts that are challenging black women as it relates to maternal health. So we're just doing it all. So again, let's give ourselves a round of applause for raising our hands and being advocates for ourselves and for our communities and for our families. Next, I have the pleasure of introducing you to two, three novel young men. And I don't know if you all know this, but BHM is really passionate about advancing health equity, believe it or not, for black men. Black men are some of the most medically underserved in this country. And so people really don't talk about that. Um, so fortunately today, we have Bertrand Thomas, who's going to be our moderator. He is the past potentate of Al Kareem Shriners Temple Number 242, and currently serves as the second imperial director of the National Community Health Initiative for the Prince Hall Shriners. And I mention that because through his relationships, his influence, and his commitment to health equity, more than 50 Prince Hall Shriners are watching virtually. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, and now I'm gonna introduce you to our wonderful twin doctors. All right, now as you know, they're a TikTok sensation. Um, you know, it's, it's fascinating how you're harnessing new media to represent and reach new people, young and old. The twin doctors, Jermaine and Jeremy Hogstrom, also known as twin doctors J, Dot J, on social media, are chief medical residents for the Authority Health GME Consortium in Detroit, Michigan, and are, <laughs> and are specializing in internal medicine. You know, they say the more doctors that we have that look like us, our outcomes get, become better. Right now, there just are not a lot of black men in medical school these days um, going through the, and so our pipeline needs to increase with more young dynamic doctors like Jermaine and Jeremy. They both chose the field of medicine due to their love for helping those most in need and are dedicated to being leaders in their community. So let's give them a round of applause and welcome them. Good morning, everyone. I bring you greetings uh, from the Prince Hall Shriners, Ancient Egyptian Arabic Order Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, A-E-A-O-N-M-S. My name is Bertram Thomas, Jr., Master of Public Health. Um, I am the director of the National Community Health Initiative for the Prince Hall Shriners, and we cover COVID-19, cancer, diabetes, HIV, AIDS, and other uh, chronic diseases that primarily uh, affect the black community and communities of color. It is a true privilege to be able to speak with the twin docs. Uh, they're from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, they graduated from University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, right up the road from where I went to school, Morehouse College. And they graduated from the Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine in Auburn, Alabama. They're very passionate about primary care. Uh, they're gonna speak about um, the social media aspect and mistrust in the uh, black communities when it comes to vaccinations, COVID-19, et cetera. Now, osteopathic medicine, it focuses on the holistic approach when it comes to working with patients. Uh, in the world of social media, these doctors have garnered over three million followers through Instagram and TikTok, using their platform to share informative medical information and messages of inspiration while using their comedic style to educate their followers as they explore their passion for media and creativity. They have been involved in multiple COVID-19 vaccine campaigns involving the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and Lieutenant Governor of Michigan. They strive to serve as positive role models for minority youth and are passionate about community outreach. The philosophy 
that they espouse to all of us is that laughter truly is the best form of medicine. Doctors Jermaine Hogstrom and Jeremy Hogstrom, doctors of osteopathic medicine. Appreciate it. All right, first of all, thank you. Um, we're so happy to be here. Thank you to um, Black Health Matters for inviting us. Um, we were very, been very excited about this event um, and are definitely wanting to come back for more, so that's for sure. <laughs> thank you. So, um, just a little bit about us. How, how did we get started in this whole deal with social media, right? So, you know, 2020, you know, um, we were interns in our residency program. We're now in our third year about to be graduating in June. Um, we were interns at the time. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And so we were in a second half of intern year, and there is, of course, COVID that comes upon us all, right? And so, you know, our intern year, we're like, gosh, you know, this is completely something we haven't ever experienced. And the only time we've ever heard anything about a pandemic was uh, probably a movie or something like I Am Legend or something like that, right? And so <laughs> this was completely new to us. Um, being interns at the time, you know, fairly inexperienced, we, we were just kind of like, well, not sure what to do. <laughs> um, we were just like you all, you know, locked at home, uh, you know, on the lockdown. Um, besides that, you know, we were going to work. So for us, it was a lot of going to the hospital, coming back to a lockdown at home, going to the hospital, and so on. And so somewhere in between that, we, we kind of figured, gosh, you know, there has to be something more that we can do. Um, you know, we feel like that we can still reach out to so many people that are at home and that, you know, don't, don't have the ability to always, basically don't have great access to healthcare or, you know, si simply the health literacy um, to quite understand what's going on with all of the new developments and everything at that time. And then, of course, you know, summer of 2020 as well was a lot of the, the civil um, justice issues. Um, so we kind of saw, saw this as a way for us to not only educate about, at the time when it was brand new, COVID and the new vaccine and information that was coming out, but also to sort of shine a light and help change the narrative on African American men in the community. You know, sometimes in mainstream media, we're not always highlighted in the best of ways. And so this is our way to sort of start to change that narrative. Yeah. So I feel that we, what we saw was that we had um, the opportunity just to really help spread a positive message, but not only that, but really share our, our story um, and what we were, we were doing. And we felt that we could do it in a very beneficial way that could really help other people, um, given what was happening at that time, and kind of really help to kind of push our, our message forward. Um, so kind of really getting into social media, you know, it's kind of funny because when I look back at it, I, I think we wouldn't really ever anticipate being where we are now. Um, but just really the, the support that we have gotten in doing what, what we do um, really solidifies that we're really on the, the right path of doing something great and really um, kind of being able to take advantage of a, of a brand new space and use it in a really creative and new way. Yeah, I, th I think that it's fair to say that over the last two or three years, we've seen how social media can be used for the, the bad, right? We've seen the negatives that can come from, from that. So we're trying to combat that and combat misinformation and be on the flip side of that where it can be productive and you can actually learn important and valuable information from that. So that's sort of, you know, the spin that we put on it. Um, and apart from that, you know, it's just really telling our journey as well while doing so, because we do feel like that people might be interested in seeing what we're doing. And, and throughout the process, we want to be able to encourage other, you know, young African-American men and women alike that, you know, you can do these same things too. You know, for us, you know, there have been many a times where we walked into a room and, and uh, you know, it, seeing people that didn't look like us, right? And so that feeling itself can be very discouraging. Um, with that being said, by us being able to be visible in this way, we know that we can inspire and encourage people to, especially, again, young African-American men and women, that they can do it too. 
And not only that, but they are also very much needed in this field and in this space. So I would say kind of uh, fast forward to uh, 2020 and you know, this, this pandemic happens. And uh, one of the important things was what was being put out into not only you know, the, the media, but what was especially being put out into social media. So as we were, you know, began to build our platform here, we really saw a, a need um, for there to be factual information that was being put out, especially in the social media space, because this is where a lot of the young people are. Um, and so in doing that, we really made it our goal to make sure that we were helping to educate the community um, in a very creative way. And so um, that people were not uh, being fearful of the facts that were not correct. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, let's kind of just dive into a little bit about why do we have, you know, the, hesitancy, the hesitancy that there is, you know, not only to, you know, get into, um, not only about taking a, a COVID vaccine or even other vaccines, but even, you know, participating in trials, there's always sort of this hesitancy to want to get involved in these things, right? Um, and of course, you know, a lot of times we can look back at his history, you know, as we've um, have heard, I'm sure by now, several discussions. Um, why this is the case, you know, just to name a few, of course, the highlighted ones um, would be, of course, the Henrietta Lacks, for those that might not be as f f familiar, the, you know, she had um, cells that are essentially uh, dividing forever. And so her, these cancerous cells have been used for a lot of research and, of course, profits and things, you know, by a lot of large um, companies without, you know, due credit or compensation toward her, um, her family. Um, we also, of course, have talked about the Tuskegee uh, experiment as well with, with um, withholding, um, you know, treatment for syphilis as well. Um, that, again, another one, another of the highlighted ones to name a few. Um, so the question is then, you know, sort of where do we go, right? You know, how do we start to repair the broken relationship, essentially, that we feel that, you know, how do we begin to, to fill the divide, right? right? And we don't have all the answers ourselves here, you know. <laughs> um, but one thing that I think we will agree to is that there has been, you know, I guess I would say a lot of fi financial, financially there's been a lot of um, things put into place. So for example, I've trained at a FQHE clinic, which, you know, targets a lot of um, populations that are underserved, right? Uh, a lot of populations that have a lot of those, what we call social de determinants of health um, factors that impact access to great health care. And by social determinants of health, I'm talking about, you know, your e economic status, what zip code do you live in, the environment that you live in, all these things that can affect you, right? So what I've noticed is that although we have these great clinics and things, it's the health, the lack of health literacy and the education that's the other half of the battle that maybe we could touch on a little bit more. And that's sort of what our mission is, is to continue to educate through us via you know, our platform on social, social media to try to really educate and put out factual um, information and um, really how we do it is in, a relatable, is in a relatable way, right? So that's ultimately what our drive is, is to continue to fill that void and um, give people you know, common medical knowledge that they might not have otherwise had access to. Yeah, um, so I feel like when you kind of look at the, the concept of mistrust and kind of backtracking um, to what, what you, were, you were saying. Um, when you look at, for example, the, the Tuskegee experiment from 1930s to the 1970s, what is, it, what is it that happened? Well, you know, you had this thing called syphilis that at the time the medical field did not know much about. So what they were doing was that they wanted to observe the, the natural progression of this disease. However, um, there was an extreme issue with there being a lack of consent. And once penicillin came out, as a uh, staple treatment for this issue, it wasn't even offered at that time. So, you know, there's, there was a lot of animosity there because there was, uh, the participants were essentially being taken advantage of um, in, that, in that trial. Um, you know, they weren't offered treatment, there was no consent given, um, and they were kind of being treated more or less than as just a research lab rat. So this, really garnered a lot of mi mistrust and, um, and that's kind of 
really the, uh, one of the core things as to what um, has really kind of carried over into now uh, why we have some of the issues that we have, have now. So kind of as you were saying, um, how do we help solve these issues? I think it begins with community outreach. It begins with rep representation in, in, in medicine so that you know, our, patients, our patients see other people that look like them and so they feel rep represented because I feel like when patients um, don't see patients or don't see healthcare pro providers that look like them, they feel like they don't have a voice. In, in medicine, and so that's when we have other issues um, similar to a topic that may have been earlier when it comes to uh, like uh, black fe female uh, maternal uh, mortality. Um, one example I was kind of jumped to is Serena Williams, because um, she's someone that has been very extremely vocal about her experiences, um, you know, her health battles during pre uh, pregnancy. And one thing she was saying is that when she was pregnant, um, you know, she experienced a lot of issues with blood clots, a lot of complications, but she felt that she wasn't being, being listened to, so she had to really be an advocate, an advocate for herself. Um, so I think it just really s starts with helping to solve those issues understanding your patient's perspective, understanding your patient's concerns, and being able to meet, your, meet the patients where, where they are. Wow. These doctors are on point in terms of covering um, really the culture of mistrust that has happened over the years and has gotten stronger and stronger. And they are at the forefront, especially in social media, in um, knocking down these barriers and um, that have really solidified over the years, like you said, through the Tuskegee experiment. Um, and this has led to vaccine hesitancy and really going against um, that culture of fear, culture of mistrust. I think it's important to understand that social determinants of health, um, looking at socioeconomic statuses of these communities um, that are largely uh, African American and peoples of color, I think it's important, um, you know, that I ask you guys about the role of healthcare disparities in this, and how does that affect vaccine hesitancy for COVID-19 and just distrust in the clinical medical field? Yeah. So, um, so I would say where we're training currently, finishing up our last year in Detroit, we have had a lot of exposure to health disparities, especially in COVID, definitely highlighted and magnified that. Um, so just, um, I wanna talk about you know, health equity, right? So what is health equity? Health equity is sort of the idea that we all essentially should be able to have equal access to healthcare and have the opportunity to, to essentially obtain our full health potential, right? Um, but as we know, that's not exactly the case, you know, due to a lot of these factors that we've mentioned. You know. And so when, wherever we're in clinic or in the hospital and we're seeing patients, we know what, how does this affect our patient care, right? You know, we see a lot of patients that come in and because of, let's say, the environment that they live in. For, for example, you know, we talk about, um, I know like, for example, Michigan had the Flint water crisis. That was an environmental issue. Um, and so, because of the environment, you know, you might be more, more uh, disposed uh, to um, like having an asthma attacks, right? Or because of your, you know, economic situation, you might have more heart failure flare-ups, exacerbations, right? Because you can't afford the medications, things like that. Um, also, insurance can also play an issue, right? Depending on what kind of insurance you have. So, and then we know insurance is often tied to what kind of job, what kind of income you have, right? So these are all the factors that culminate together to essentially brew a perfect storm. And then when something like COVID comes around, it's, it's, you know, it's just devastating, right? So these are the effects that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, you know? And so for us, we try not to like let's say somebody comes in with a high blood pressure, we don't, I don't judge them for that. I try to figure out why is that, the, what are the underlying factors that are blocking you from having a controlled blood pressure? Is it something as, you don't have a blood pressure cuff at home or 
Is it an issue, you know, getting access to the medications, or you know, what, you know, what is what are the actual underlying factors that we need to consider, or is it simply you can't afford a, a ride to the pharmacy or to your doctor's visit, right? So these are a lot of the factors that we try to take into account and that we need to always be considering whenever we're looking at the person, the patient, you know, as a whole, um, moving forward. Yeah, and kind of really going, kind of jumping on what, what you're saying there. <clears throat> Um, the, so I kind of feel like it's a very, it's a very multi-factorial thing, right? It goes to, there's a financial component, a social component, and environmental component. So I know I've seen patients um, that really express mistrust in the sense that they feel like, okay, well, this system doesn't work for me. This system is not for me. There's no one here that is here to, to support me. Um, and the reason is because, you know, these factors affect everyone differently. Um, not everyone is able to afford certain things. So when you, when you see this, they, that's why, uh, or why I believe there's a component of mistrust there because they feel like the system is so stacked against them that they cannot really, that they don't have the opportunity to really achieve their, their, their best health outcome. Unbelievable. Um, and I, the last part you said, uh, that feeling of despair and kind of feeling like, you know, you can't achieve your goals. So proper health care, going to the doctor, main, main, maintenance of health goes on the back burner. Yeah. And they're not getting treated. They're not being seen. They don't have the proper health education. And it leads to the widening of, the, of this gap of health disparities. So. At this time, I want to take any questions from the audience for the doctors. Please come up to the microphone. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Good morning. My question and kind of a comment is as far as bringing awareness to the side effects of the COVID vaccine, like I've had all three shots, but the first and second shot were similar side effects, but my parents are like 80, 82. They had no side effects at all. But when I got that booster, that was it. I had inflammation in my breast. I went to my doctor to get a mammogram and sonogram. It's like, they don't talk about that. A lot of women go through these things and it's like, it's not made public. So I think more awareness of our side effects and I know it's a new vaccine. So there's a lot of trial and error, but that was really scary and was painful for days after the booster. First and second was fine. So do they do something different with the booster that they didn't do with the first two shots? Okay, so I'm glad you brought that up. First of all, I want to touch on the, the, the side effects. Um, so the side effects that with the COVID vaccine is pretty much with um, any other vaccine. So you're, you know, you can expect again, you can expect to have, um, you know, you might have a fever, you might have, you might feel sore, you might feel like you have the flu, right? Because it's this, it's your immune system that's responding, that's causing these sim symptoms. Um, you can, so you can expect to have body aches. You might have um, basically an ejection site reaction or like a, a, a rash on your arm or, you know. Um, so these are, those are the more common things. And what she was talking about in regards to for like feeling sore in the breast and things. So also it can um, cause like swelling of your lymph nodes too. Uh, swelling of lymph nodes is also a natural part of your immune response when it's trying to fight against, you know, well, in this case, is building an immune response, but it's all part of like sort of like an inflammatory response, right? Um, when it comes to that, so I know what was happening um, was that when we were, you know, you would get swollen lymph nodes, oftentimes in like your armpits or something like like that, um, and then you know now from a, let's say like a mem a mammogram pr perspective or a cancer a breast cancer screening pr perspective. Um, that's like, let, let's say a factor that they would look into for like breast cancer, right? But actually, because this is an anticipated response with vaccine, not just COVID vaccine, but really most vaccines in general, is actually advised to not, let's say, go get a mammogram right away after you've gotten the vaccine because that enlarged lymph node from the vaccine can falsely lead to, you know, basically lead to additional testing and more expenses is actually not necessary because it's an expected response to the vaccine. Um, in regards to the boosters, the boosters aren't necessarily different at all. It's just an additional dose of the vaccine, essentially, um, 
this is what it is. It's not necessarily anything that's been changed with any of the ingredients or anything added or taken away. Um, but I do want to touch on some of, you know, what you might hear in the media as far as, you know, uh, blood clotting issues and um, what were some of the other ones? Uh, uh, the, yeah, so there was a blood clotting. Um, I think they mentioned... Um, I think that was one of, one of the, the biggest ones. Yeah, I think that was like really one of the biggest ones. But there was the there was the um, the carditis, like in inflammation of the heart, things like yeah, like pericarditis. Um, when it comes to those issues, I, um, which is still being looked into, you have to keep in mind that that was a very small subset of the population, the people that received the vaccine. We're talking about out of millions of people that received the vaccine, that's maybe like a couple of thousand, right? So you can kind of see how that might be taken a little bit out of context when it comes to media, because sometimes media, especially mainstream media, might blow it up a little bit bigger. Um, also, the fact that because we have such accessible media, you're gonna hear about these things more often than not, which might also make it appear that these things are you know, always being directly related to the vaccine. Um, but again, you know, so, those, those, so as far as a direct cause and effect relationship, there's, that's still being invest investigated, but at this time, nothing has consistently um, been uh, evidence basically has not consistently pointed to the fact that it was the vaccine for these causes. Yeah. And, and also, just kind of jumping on that just real, real quick, um, the, the important thing to really know is that you have to look at the um, kind of like the benefit to risk ratio, right? So the, the benefit, there's a much greater benefit in getting the vaccine than there is of any risk of a side effect of the vaccine. And there's also a much greater benefit of getting the vaccine um, compared to when you look at the potential risk, I'm sorry, uh, co uh, potential risk of what that you can have from, from COVID uh, itself. Yep. And one, one last thing, uh, when it comes, now the things that you should be also looking out for though, that are more serious um, as far as getting a vaccine, I would say if you've ever um, had an allergic reaction to let's say Miralax, there's a, um, the main ingredient in that, sometimes people have a, an, an allergic reaction to, uh, to that, which is something you might want to talk to your doctor about as far as not getting the vaccine. Um, also, if you've ever had an allergic reaction to a COVID vaccine before, which again, is, within itself is actually not common, but it can happen, um, you want to talk, you, you, again, it would be advised to actually not get a second dose of the COVID vaccine because of that allergic reaction. When I say allergic reaction, I'm talking about, you know, getting hives. Um, if you're talking about anaphylaxis, you're talking about, you know, your throat closing up, you can't breathe, your blood pressure might drop, um, things along those, those lines. So those are more of the concerning things that you would definitely say absolute no to your next dose and um, want to consider, uh, def definitely seek medical help if you're experiencing th those things. Yes. Doctors, first of all, I want to say God bless you and thank you for your journey and for your mission of providing health care for people who look like us. Thank you. Um, but one thing I want to address is uh, people's ability to have trust and faith in the medical industry. And I'd like for you to speak more on, I think people don't understand the difference between allopathic medicine and osteopathic medicine, and you are DOs. And people need to understand what DOs are and that the mission is about whole body healing, about diet, about lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And once we understand that there are doctors who can address our needs from a lifestyle perspective, that will break down that wall of distrust. So can you talk about being a DO versus an MD so that people understand that and understand that there are doctors who will listen to us as opposed to direct us? Um, so, so that, that's actually a very, very good, very good point. And, and thank, thank you for, for bringing that, that up. So a lot of people don't, don't know there is, you know, for those that go to med school, there is a doctor of allopathic medicine, there's a doctorate of osteopathic medicine. Um, so what's the, the difference? So, you know, kind of the similarities, we're all pretty much taught the same principles of, of, of medicine. Um, when you go to a, a, a DO school, um, they really harp on really looking at the social factors of one's health, um, really a holistic approach, as, as he was saying, um, and because they really want you to factor in all those things when it comes to their health, their health outcomes. Um, so, kind of that's kind of more of it in, in a nutshell. Um, we are trained to do o, uh, OMT, which is osteopathic uh, manipulative therapy, um, and that is essentially um, a musculoskeletal based approach um, to really help alleviate symptoms for for patients.
Yeah, and ju um, just to kind of explain what uh, OMT is, a lot of times it, it, it has similar origins to like chiropractic work where you're working on, you know, the bones and the muscles and things like that. We also work with the, like, the lymphatic system. You know, if you have like, for example, swelling in your, in your legs, there are maneuvers that you can do as well to help relieve that. So basically, um, again, just like you said, you know, we're D DO, that which is osteopathic, uh, a doctor of osteopathic medicine. M uh, M MD is, is a doctor of allopathic medicine. So basically it's like two, two different versions. Um, and again, um, in, in addition to the medical training that we get at medical school, we also have spent several hours in addition to, to that in labs learning a lot of the bodily functions and other ways to uh, treat those uh, as well, so. Uh, that will be the last question. Please submit uh, other questions that you have. Brother, I see you and I see you also. Please uh, write your questions down and I'll come through, I'll take them from you, I'll give them to the doctor and they will answer those. Thank you everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you.